Welcome to Comics Are Awesome, brought to you by Alter Ego Comics. I'm Mark. And I'm Alex. And we're here to talk about this week's best comics, and there's all kinds of cool stuff to choose from. We've got stuff from Marvel, stuff from DC, some indie stuff, and we'll kick things off with Superman Smashes the Clan. That's right, that clan. Superman Smashes the Clan, issue number one, written by our pal Gene Lun Yang, artwork by... Gurihiru Got enough on that one He's done He or she I don't know <laughs> They They've done some work At Marvel Not too long ago it, It's kind of Cartoony I think it fits the story Really well And I, I didn't I didn't know what to expect From this First off It's in an odd format It's in kind of the um, It's like oh, a digest Like a kid's it's, digest It's bigger than a digest But Smaller than a traditional graphic novel or comic, and it is a three-part series with each part running you seven ninety-nine. So this is basically adapting a Superman radio show from the nineteen forties about an Asian family moving into a city in uh, California, I believe. Oh, I, there's I'm sorry, Metro, I don't know where it was in the radio drama, but in the book, it's Metropolis. I should have figured that out. And the racism that they encounter there, and they essentially encounter the Klan uh, in this book. And it, it's, it's really good. This is, this is rated E for everyone, which is apparently a new rating for comics because I'm used to A for all ages. Right. Uh, but it's E for everyone, much like your video game ratings. And it's it's 1940 Superman, so it's 1946. World War II is over. The opening scene involves a uh, Nazi superpowered person that has a connection loosely to Superman. But this is a Superman who's still figuring out his powers, who doesn't fly. He's able to leap tall buildings, but he's not able to fly. And it's it's nostalgic and f it's fun despite the clan. <laughs> It's fun uh, because he beats up the clan. It's fun because... Well, we don't even get to that or, point, really, where there's a whole lot of beating up of the clan. But it, we get to see a more innocent Superman than than present day. And the really, the main characters of this book are the two kids, um, Roberta and Tommy. It is, it's Tommy and Roberta. And getting to see how they get to adjust to life in Metropolis through their eyes. Uh, the the boy, Tommy, is all fired up, and he's awestruck by Metropolis, and he's always been good with people. He fits right in with a lot of the, the neighborhood kids. And Roberta is more reserved, timid, afraid. Gene Yang does a great job of writing younger characters, but he's also written Superman in the past for DC. And just the, the, the melding is great. Uh, the, I... It felt like I was watching a Superman animated series episode in a way. So the, the, the don't be put off by the size of this. Uh, we have it up on our new release wall, and it's kind of weird sitting there next to regular size comics. But it is a lot thicker too. Um, it is. I mean, it's it's a whole lot of story, a whole lot of pages, and there's a nice uh, write up in the back from from Gene Yang that will continue in future issues. It's called Superman and Me, about how he got into the character of Superman and what it was like for him growing up an Asian American uh, in the United States. And he is closer to my age, if not exactly my age. So it's, it's kind of, I don't want to say depressing to realize that, that he was facing racism and discrimination, you know, in the eighties um, and possibly nineties. I mean, I think sad and depressing would be accurate. I mean, it, it, I mean, it's still around today. I mean, let's right, not kid ourselves. That's why it's it's sad that it is still around. Also, like it's sad that it's going on today. And yeah, did you read this? Uh, not yet. I I got intimidated by the <laughs> amount of content there is versus everything else that came out this week. I, I will say I didn't read it last night. I read it this morning. I um, I plan on reading it. It just I didn't have time yet. So, but yeah, I I would highly. I, I do highly recommend it. I think it's a great story. It's a it's a story that uh, is nostalgic yet yet timely today, and I think the combination of Jin Yang on words and Gurihiru on images is fantastic. So I'm looking forward to the next part. I think this is every other month. 
Um, what month are we? Yes, next so, issue's on sale December 18th. So yeah, it's two months. Yep. So Superman smashes the clan. My pick of the week. Uh, I guess my pick of the week then was Once and Future issue number three by Kieran Gillen and Dan Mora. Uh, we haven't talked about the other ones because we've been on a hiatus, I guess. But the short story is there's this grandma that has recruited her grandson that is like college age, 20 something there ish where she has spent her entire life hunting vampires, werewolves, anything mythical, mystical, whatever, and recruited him. And, of course, he's like, "What? wait, what? You do this? this, this these don't exist. She's like, well, they, you, you, don't, you never saw one because I killed them for you. And now she's, like, getting to the point of getting close to retirement and then recruits him. And in this issue, it introduces a new character where he had been on one date with and like, oh, well, you're a something, I think like at Harvard or something, or Yale, or I don't know, college, college in, collegian, professor-ish. And they recruit her, and now she's going through the same thing he was just two issues before. Like, what do you mean all this stuff is real? And she's very, it's like, oh, he's somewhat middle age of like, middle of figuring out where it's at. Grandma knows the best. He's there, and she's brand new. And he's like, oh, yeah, this, she's kind of crazy. So, it's been a fun story where... I've enjoyed it, and it follows the return of King Arthur, the once and future king of England, and it has good mystic, crazy creepiness to it. Have you read? I have. I, I read issue one, and I really enjoyed it. And I didn't come back for issue two or three. Just it's it, it fell off of my my to read pile. Uh, but I will either revisit the single issues or check out the trade when it comes out. Uh, because I really did like that first issue. In fact, it may have been my pick of the week when it came out. This one was just, it surprised me every time. It's a fun, it's its a fun, adventurous, like, zany, but grounded in reality still. And I don't know, if you like, I guess, if you like sex criminals, it's along that style of humor, I think. Of That style of humor, not the same content, but the same style where it's serious and it's comedy. Well, I think, you know, Kieran Gillen wrote, wrote? Wrote wrote Wicked and the Divine and I think that you know that's if you if you enjoyed Wicked and the Divine you should be reading Once in the Future um, I heard someone else describe it as uh, you know Indiana Jones as if Indiana Jones was an 80 year old grandma yeah. um, so if you're into 80 year old grandmas <laughs> or Indiana Jones uh, or uh, sword, and, sword and Sorcery Fantasy Magic yeah, all that if you're reading Die by Kieran Gillen you should Absolutely, totally read yeah. Once in the Future by Kieran Gillen uh, the book that's probably gotten the most buzz, advanced buzz this week, is X-Men number one. This is written by Jonathan Hickman, artwork by Laniel Yu, and is the continuation of the story that Hickman began in House of X and Powers of Ten. Uh, in fact, it is a direct continuation. There is, there is no real explanation about what's going on in the world. Um, I, I would say that reading House and Powers are a pre -re prerequisite to reading this. I think it will be for all the upcoming Dawn of X books that are coming out. Yep, yep. But this is, I think, you're going to be surprised by this in a way. It's more more talking, less action, I think, than, than maybe people are expecting. For multiple reasons, it kind of reminds me of the Fantastic Four. It's, it's really reestablishing... The X Men as a family, yeah, and key members. I mean, the the Summers family is really the at the center of this issue. I, I think there will be for the entire series of at least for the entire run that Hickman's doing right now he's, of X Men. He yeah. set it up that this is the Summers clan. I do find it interesting. So everyone on the cover is is a Summers, except for Wolverine, because <laughs> Wolverine has to be in everything to sell books. I, apparently. apparently, so yeah, the, and he lives with them. Which is kind of super weird with him and Gene and Cyclops. Yeah. And I, uh, they're into that now. And uh, who is that guy? I don't. I'm not that's familiar. Vulcan, uh, who was in Ed Brubaker's run okay. of uh, of X Men. So he is the long lost Summers brother. Um, yeah, his I don't name know is who Vulcan. Was. And yes, he's a little little weird. So you got Havoc. Uh, so Alex Summers, Scott Summers, Vulcan Summers, uh, Corsair. Jean, who I don't know if she's still married to Cyclops or not. We I haven't really established that. And then it Rachel Summers, the, their daughter from an alternate future. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then Wolverine. 
because uh, he just hangs oh, out. I'm sorry, Cable. Cable's there, too. Uh, young and Cable. I, it's Young Cable, even though the image on the cover appears to be uh, more... He looks like mid-20s in the cover. Yeah, he's like Teen Cable that we saw most recently in... Last we knew, in the previous X-Men iteration, and then yeah. the X-Force that was going on and all that. So there's stuff going on here. There's, there's forward momentum... Um, but really, it's an opportunity. The Summers family has a has a family dinner, uh, and so they're <laughs> they're able to to take a breath after the events of uh, House and Powers, which were happening at all different time periods. So um, yeah. we're early on in the world of or in the the mutant nation of Krakoa. Um, so is this our recap of House of Powers? Also, <laughs> no, I think that should be uh, that should be separate. That should be separate. We'll need a Maybe diagram, we'll and it. then yes. Yes, and there are some nice diagrams here, as uh, usual with Jonathan Hickman books. We actually get a, a diagram of the Summers compound uh, and whose room is where. And I've really enjoyed the little side computer oh, yeah. files that they've done yeah. with everything, which makes me wonder what's going on big picture with that. So if you've enjoyed Powers and House, you absolutely want to continue with X-Men, although I do think it's going to... My take is that it's going to be a little bit of a slow burn. That this was not the first issue that I expected. Uh, I expected a little more action. Yeah. Um, it reminded me of a lot of the end of House and Powers. Like House yeah. and Powers started out very strong, and then it started like world building. And I think this continues on that. We're getting to something major that's going to happen. Yeah. But we don't know. Yeah. There's still stuff when. going on with the the bad guys at what Orcus or whatever the name of the that facility the is. agency. Yeah, it is Orcus. Okay. So, plus, if you need another incentive to pick up X-Men number one, uh, here at Alter Ego, you do get a free pack of uh, Dawn of X trading, trading cards? cards. They're all the same. They've, I'm they've sure. got the Krakoan language on the back. So Actually, if you really... Or I'm, I haven't opened this yet, so I want to see what all's inside. Ooh, an unboxing. I'll try and not have it directly on the mic. So it starts with Excalibur number... Okay, so it's a bunch of covers. Yeah, it's the covers and of the book. Some Krakoan, or no, there's, yeah, Krakoan stuff that we'll figure out. A whole bunch of number ones, and then just a key for the rest of the books when you need the language. You'll have it, and yeah. So, one, two, three, four, five, six. Yeah, all six different number one regular covers. From the Dawn of X. From the Dawn of X books. And then what you do is you get these, you lock yourself in your bathroom with a notepad and a pencil, and you use your secret Krakoan decoder card uh, to find out that you should drink your Ovaltine. And, yes. Uh, take your vitamins and <laughs> buy, buy two of these so you get double so you don't have to flip back and forth for the card. So you can just have one on the front side, the other one on the back side. You'll be good to go. Yeah. So, free pack of, uh, of X-Men, Dawn of X cards with codes on them when you buy X-Men number one, at least here at Alter Ego. So, uh, you handed it off to me, so I'm guessing I'm going to start talking about that. Or I can start talking about it. You're going to work on the sure. cards, too? Sure. Well, uh, take care of it. Uh, Spider-Man, number two, by J.J. Abrams and Henry Abrams and Sarah Pacelli? All right. So, if you've been following Spider-Man by J.J. Abrams, or if you have not, then here's your quick recap. It's a different timeline. You don't need to worry about anything Spider-Man beforehand, other than, do you know who Mary Jane is? Do you know who Spider-Man is? That's really all you need to know going into this. First issue, they did a... Spoiler alert. Time jump. It's been 30 days since it's been out, so... Yeah. Um, Mary Jane died in the first issue. So, she died, then it jumped another 10 years or so, I want to say. I think so. And then, so it was following, their, it was following Peter and their son, Ben? Benji? Is it just Benny? Ben? Benji? Benny? Ben? Benjamin? It's all some sort of Uncle Ben rename or whatever. I think he's named after the thing. Uh, or after the thing, yeah. All right. It's following him trying to be a, basically a young Spider-Man, trying to figure out his place in life. With But there are no other superheroes since all of them died except for Tony Stark, it seems. And then all of a sudden, here he is around with superpowers and figuring out how to be the new Spider-Man. And there's a new villain that they created. What's his name? Cadaverous. Cadaverous. Kind of weird, but it's a J.J. Abrams cre creation. There is more to it, <laughs> more, I, I think. Uh, you have a strained relationship between Peter and Ben 
because Peter's way of dealing with the death of Mary Jane is to, and he also lost an arm in in the battle with Cadaverous ten years ago or whenever it was, uh, is to retreat from those that love him. So throw, and throw himself into work. Yeah. So he's he's back to being a photographer and he's globe trotting. You know, he's going into war zones. He has hung up the the spider suit and is no longer no one's seen Spider Man in ten years. And uh, in this issue, his son Ben, who is exhibiting spider like powers, may or may not put the suit on. So. And in this reality, it is important to know that Aunt May is still around and she does know. Great Aunt May, yep. She does know that Peter was <clears throat> Spider Man. Yep, yep. So that's kind of a key thing to know because, yeah, it, it, it comes up in this. It's. It, since we didn't do a video when the first issue came out, I think we both picked the first issue as our pick the I week it came out. Right. This far exceeded my expectations. I, I thought we were going to be getting a story by a 16-year-old kid whose dad is famous and the kid wants to write comics. Right. I mean, and that, that's not that, saying that's not how it that happened. That may be what it is and that may be how it happened. I mean, the guy's older than 16, I think. But, but the story is much better than I anticipated. It is written by a fan for a fan, I would say. Yeah, yeah. So it's it's a little bit like one we're going to get to in a minute, but it's almost a, a what if or an, an alternate universe. It's Kinda a standalone dark. story. It is dark. It's a li- I've mentioned this before, but not recently. Um, you know, maybe this is a little little Dark Knight Returns ish for Spider Man. Yeah. Um, but it will it will stand alone and be a nice addition to your graphic novel collection if you're not getting the single issues. Um, but Spider Man gets a thumbs up for me. Thumbs up from Alex. It's a fun book. Oops. Did you read this? Uh, no, I'll be the audience on this one. I'm okay. Asking questions. So, Vault Comics is a relatively new publisher. I say relatively new. It's been a couple of years since they've started putting out content. And uh, I've been really impressed by some of their, their horror content. There was a book that came out a couple weeks ago called The Plot, which I thought was very solid, very solid horror book. And this week, it's cult classic number one creature feature uh, I'm not sure if creature feature is the subtitle or the storyline uh, it's episode one it's the storyline so episode one creature feature this is written uh, by Elliot Rahal illustrated by John Bivens and this is basically taking all of the EC horror type stuff from the 1950s and bringing it to present day uh, and throw in a, a dash of Stranger Things, and you've got this crazy book that features aliens and uh, a group of, of teenagers having a sleepover, um, a, a um, late-night radio host that's similar to, like, Elvira, but a dude... <laughs> So all this stuff is happening at the same time, and uh, just crazy, crazy stuff. I enjoyed it. To me, it felt like a classic 50s uh, horror movie, something like The Blob, but definitely set in, in present day. I didn't realize that young people swore so much. <laughs> There's like maybe, well, maybe they do, but... Um, they learn a lot in the school bus. And it's a sleepover. It's a co-ed sleepover. Uh, which was kind of, I, I don't know what grade these kids are in. I'm guessing like fifth or sixth. Um, but who knows? That's beside the point. The point is, if you're looking for something spooky for this Halloween season, uh, you should totally check out Cult Classic number one. And you might have said earlier, well, when does it take place-ish? It takes place in present day. Um, so, there's the, the intro. Cause it, very, it looks like a very much retro style art. Yeah. Yeah, but it's it's present day. You know, there's cell phones and... Uh, so that's why it's co-ed, because modern day, I guess? I, I, don't, I know. don't know. Maybe. But it's good. And check out the plot, too, if you haven't uh, checked that one out yet. Spooky Fun from Vault Comics. Did you read that one? Uh, <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. I mean, I, I started a little bit, and then I was falling asleep because I was staying up too late. Okay. This week we get the launch of the Tales from the Dark Multiverse line from DC Comics. And this is very much an Elseworlds-inspired line, kind of a what-if, if if you're a Marvel fan, where DC is taking classic events from DC's past and exploring what could have happened if something changed. However, this is narrated by... His name is Tempest Fuginaut. 
Uh, I'm calling him Duato. He's, yeah, he's kind of like the Watcher. <laughs> uh, one of the only beings who can move freely between the multiverse's two realms. So we've got the Dark Multiverse, and we've got the Multiverse. So Dark Multiverse was introduced in Dark Knight's Metal, and that's where these stories are set. They're set within the world of the Dark... They're set within the Dark, mul- dark Multiverse. Ugh. Oh, i got to take a breath there for a minute. Okay, so this is Batman Nightfall set within the Dark Multiverse. So in this story, Bane breaks Batman's back. Uh, Azrael inherits the mantle of the Bat and never gives it up again. So, and oh, now, quite viciously. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it's there's some creepy stuff in here. This is definitely sci-fi horror, I would say, yeah. uh, with this one. And so the story takes place 30 years after the breaking of Batman. So Azrael is Batman, and so you see what Gotham City looks like under Azrael's rule. Bruce Wayne is still around, but uh, maybe not in a form that you would expect. And others of the Bat family are still running around. It's a done-in-one. It's uh, it's a prestige format comic. It's oversized. It's written, I should say, by Scott Snyder, he of Dark Knight's Metal fame. And, and Batman, Court of the Owls fame. And, and a bunch of other stuff. Batman, Last Night, Last Night on Earth. And Kyle Higgins, uh, who did some great work with Nightwing during uh, New 52. Artwork is by Javier Fernandez. And it, it's it's a must-read for Batman fans. So these are the some of the number one issues that we recommend that we think you should check out. Uh, let us know what you what you liked this week, what you picked up at your local comic shop. And if you liked this episode, please like, comment, and share. We want to help get it in front of uh, anybody that appreciates comics that are awesome. If you have any questions, please post them in the comments. We'll make sure that we get to them. And as always, thank you for watching. We'll see you again real soon.